Hey everyone, welcome to another quick test professional tutorial. We are QTPTutorial.net and our goal is to bring you the highest quality QTP tutorials on the web. We try to teach you everything from A to Z about automation with QTP. And maybe along the process, we will help you learn some stuff. We aim to target everybody from a beginner to an expert helping you to grow as an automation engineer, possibly even increasing your salary so you can be making that nice 70 bucks an hour. Anyway, so let's get started. This is session number three of our API testing with UFT. We've covered all of this stuff in the past two sessions. If you missed it, make sure you guys go watch those videos. We covered a lot of topics there, and I don't want you guys to be lost here. They are a good prerequisite for this video. So, in this part three, we are actually going to start interacting with UFT and doing a whole bunch of interesting stuff. And I'm very excited to show it to you guys. So, first thing is first, we are going to test web services based on SOAP today. And what I have to tell you guys about is another definition. Yes, I know I've been giving you guys a lot of definitions, but it's very important. We're learning a whole new topic, completely different from GUI. And so there is a whole bunch of terminology that you need to understand before we can proceed. So with SOAP-based web services, there's the most important piece of testing them, and that is called the WSDL. Right here, you guys see those four letters, WSDL. People refer to it as a WSDL. Now, a WSDL is used for helping us test the SOAP-based services. There's actually another type of service called a REST-based service, and we'll get to that in another time. But right now, we're focusing on SOAP-based services. And SOAP, we discussed it in previous sections. It's all over here. You guys can check that out. And what a WSDL is... According to the W3C, it's an XML format for describing network services as a set of endpoints operating on messages containing either document-oriented or procedure-oriented information. So, what does that mean to you guys? Well, it's an XML that just gives you a set of endpoints, and endpoints being just like a place to communicate and based on that, you can invoke certain actions that are supposed to be performed, and those actions will give you back some kind of a response. So, let's take a look. One tip that I want to give you guys with testing SOAP-based web services, when you're given a WSDL, make sure you take it and you put it in your browser to make sure it works. This will automatically tell you whether there's something wrong with the web service or not. If it works fine, you may proceed. If not, you may need to speak to development or management to figure out why the web service is not functioning as it should. So, how does a WSDL look? Well, it looks like a simple URL with a WSDL at the end. You guys see this? And this guy actually got from Joe Colantonio's book. It's a very great book. You guys should check it out. The UFT API Testing Manifesto. I read it myself. It's a very good guide on testing with UFT. And so in there, he has this example. I'm going to grab it, and we're going to play with it today. So let me open up a browser to test it. Place it in here, and let's check out what a WSDL looks like. So you guys already know it's an XML, and so you guys can see it's in an XML format. And it has, you know, different per elements. Over here, it has different services. So, for example, we can check out this GOIP service. And they even have documentation. It enables you to easily identify, look up countries by IP address. So, this just kind of, you may have to get familiar with it. You may have to speak with your developers, with some other testers, and understand what the service does. Remember, guys, in the previous sessions, we realized that the most important part of testing web services is understanding the functionality. Once you understand the functionality of it, all it is is just invoking those methods and testing them appropriately. So this is what it looks like, guys, just an XML 
with different information, different elements, different methods that return different objects and properties and so on. Okay? So now that you guys know how the WSDL looks, let's look at some considerations when testing web services. There's a good five, and if you're automating all this and you start with all of this, it would be a great start, a great set of test cases for you to do. So, first thing you may want to consider is does the service respond with correct values? A lot of you may know this is positive testing. Very simple, you know, provide a value and make sure that it returns the appropriate response. And we'll go through all these one by one. I'll show you guys with UFT what's going on. And in fact, Let's go do that now. I'm going to open up UFT. Let me delete this and create a new one for you guys. This is UFT, guys. Anybody that doesn't know about it, I actually have already multiple tutorials on it teaching you guys how to interact with it, what it does. So if you're unclear about what the heck is going on here and what happened to QTP, make sure you go catch those because now this is UFT version 11.5. So we're going to select API test. I'm going to name it SOAP Web Services. Let's add it. Okay. First thing we want to do is come up here and import a WSDL. And from a URL. And I'm going to paste that in here just like we did in our browser. Click OK. Give it some time. It's going to import. And so what it's going to do is it's going to parse this XML and it's going to give us back all of the methods. All these methods you guys can see over here. Check it out. So these are all the methods. When you invoke them, you can pass values to them. They'll return you something back. It's in a user-friendly version for you so that you don't have to deal with the scripting. So if we want to get this service, for example. Okay, I want to invoke it. Just like from previous tutorials, guys, we just drag and drop in here. And now we have a step in our test case, which is the get GAOIP. And we can come in here and we can give it an expected value. So what is it expecting here? It's expecting an IP address. This is according to the XML schema. Something you guys would just have to understand whenever you're working at a project and it wouldn't be too hard for you guys to understand just because you would have time to speak to your team about it and what's going on. So if I enter an IP address, for example, let's use this one. And see what happens when I run it. So I just put the IP address in here just because this get GIP service is going to send this IP address and get something back. And we're going to run. And what we are expecting here is to return us a country of where this IP address is. And so now it's going to run. Check it out. Check out the print log down there. And now we can take a look at the results. Expand everything. And check out this call right here. So if we scroll down, we can see the SOAP request and the SOAP response. Look what it sent. It sent an IP address and it returned a success and a country name, United Kingdom. Also it returned a country code. Okay? So this is what it returned to us. So it's a successful test, and this is testing the service with positive values. You guys see that positive testing? So, you know, you can obviously parameterize this, create this one test, and insert a whole bunch of different values, and so on. Next thing you want to consider when testing web services is whether the behavior is what it's supposed to be to reflect what the end user wants. So, for example, if we have that web service, get GOIP, right? It's supposed to return us the country code, country name. And it doesn't do that. It returns us, I don't know, the flag of, I don't know, something else or some color or something that's irrelevant, something that is not intended by the user. You can test it for that too, right? Because if 
the service is not working as it should and you are expecting to get some value back, you need to make sure that that type of value is coming back. Okay, I hope that makes sense. It's kind of hard to do an example here because these services are functioning correctly. But, you know, you, you just put in this thing, you just put in the IP address and just make sure that it's returning you what it's supposed to return. That it's not returning you something crazy like some kind of, I don't know, token or some other, other random thing that it may return. Obviously, scripting errors do happen and they, sometimes they will return you guys something weird. So then you can go log a bug and figure those issues out with your development. Next thing, a performance factor. You can check to see how fast your service responds. So, you know, you can insert some kind of a timer to see how long it takes for the service to execute. I'm actually trying to see if UFT has this option. Not sure about that right now, but it's not too relevant. We can just obviously insert some timers at some point. I'll figure that out in the future. I am not fully acclimated to UFT either yet as I picked it up only about two, three weeks ago. Anyway, so yeah, just insert some performance and see how long it takes for the web service to respond and see what is the acceptable values for the software or the system that you guys are developing. Next thing, another performance measure is whether unexpected loads can be handled by the service. Now this goes into load testing and usually involves Load Runner, another HP tool that I do not have and that I cannot teach you guys. But what happens there is you just create a whole bunch of virtual users and you hit those web services with large loads to see how it responds. A lot of times applications may not be load tested and so you know when you expect 100 users to come on the website and it gets hit with a thousand or 10,000 users the application crashes it crashes maybe the back end and so on and so load testing is extremely important if you expect to have a general pretty large amount of users hitting your web services and finally a lot of you guys may know about negative testing is you can check to see whether the web services can handle invalid values. So for example, come back here. So we know that this is expecting an IP address, but what happens if I don't give it an IP address, but a string of random characters? Will the backend crash or will the web service give me a proper response? Let's see what happens. This is negative testing. You guys can do same thing as you do with your GUI tests. There's just a simple interaction with web services. One second compilation error. Okay, let's see if it's fixed. Run. Yes. Compiling. You guys see that down here. Compilation finished successfully. It's going to run. Now we can see the results. Let's expand and check out what we got here. So check it out. The SOAP request this is what we sent is these values and what we got back is invalid ip address that's awesome that's exactly how the web service should function right because it's expecting an ip address and it got the string of random characters then of course you know you can throw in a whole bunch more characters you can try different kinds of combinations boundary testing whatever and make sure that your web service is responding accordingly and guys, of course, we can always do checkpoints like we did before in our other tutorials. For example, we can come down here to get geo IP results and we can validate some values, right? Like return code. What did we expect? GBR, I think country name, United Kingdom. Okay. And then we can run it and see what happens. 
make sure these validates open up. You guys see it's disabled. When I click validate, it opens up the field to be validated. Compiling down here. Compilation finished successfully. Now it's sending the SOAP request. We got the response back. And by the way, do you guys see how fast this is compared to GUI testing? Like you've tested this GOIP service multiple times already so fast. And imagine if you had to do it in the UI. You probably have to, you know, imagine if you're like going into Google and you're typing in this IP address and trying to see what it returns. That's what you would have to do if you were automating it, how much more time it would take. So this failed. I think because I didn't provide some of the correct codes, we can actually see checkpoints. So checkpoint two, uh, success because we expected GBR, actual value success, and oh, that, that's what failed. And then here we expected the United Kingdom and we got back United Kingdom. So this was just my fault because this is my first time working with this web service and I'm not too familiar in all of the details. So I just entered the incorrect value. We should have been looking for a success value. And I can tell you that this web service is working correctly just because it's known, it's already been tested, it's in production, and it's what I'm using as an example because it does function correctly. Okay, so that is part three. We're already at 20 minutes. I can't believe how fast time flies when I'm teaching you guys all this stuff. I hope you've enjoyed this session today. If you guys got any questions, of course, feel free to leave comments. We are always here to help you guys. UFT 11.5 has changed it up quite a bit, so I'm sure there may be a lot of questions regarding these topics. And of course, guys, don't forget to subscribe to our email list you will get all of these amazing benefits up here and they are all free. So there is no loss on your part. And be sure to watch session number four. We'll continue with the rest of this. It's a huge topic and will probably last for a while. Thanks for tuning in guys so much. We sincerely appreciate your guys' time and how you take a little bit out of your day to tune in and stay with us. It's extremely awesome. Thanks. Have a good day.